I want to thank uh, Dr. Nathaniel Frisell, Dr. David Kasdan, uh, the entire committee, and everyone else who's been responsible for putting on this, uh, this terrific conference. It's been wonderful. I want to thank Ward for giving us a, a very entertaining and challenging keynote last night. That was terrific. So thank you guys. It's great. The history of the Case Amateur Radio Club does not go as far back as W1MX at, uh, at MIT or W9YB at Purdue. But nonetheless, it has a, a rich history of, of achievement and, uh, and on-the-air activities. So, if, um, if you, with your indulgence, I would like to uh, examine the last 80 years of amateur radio here on the campus of Case Western Reserve University. Sound like a good plan? All right. W8URD was the original call sign. Uh, the hostilities of World War II ended on August 15, 1945. Six days later, the suspension of amateur radio activity in the United States was lifted. Uh, on August 21st, 1945. Not long afterward, WAURD was issued. This is the first uh, call book appearance of the WAURD call sign. Now, the, the call sign is, uh, is registered to R.W. Beckwith. Now, R.W. Beckwith was W-8-O-O-Q. Uh, He's a little hard to track down. His last appearance in the call book was actually in the 1941 issue. Now, as we know, um, there were no call books printed during the war years. So we don't have call books in uh, uh, 42 through 45. And he, he does not appear in any call book published after, uh, after the war. I did find some information on him in the spring 1957 issue of the, uh, the Theta Tau magazine. Apparently he worked for General Electric most of his career. Uh, it says that if, if he pledged Theta Tau in 41, he would have been a senior in 45, so the timing pretty much works out. He, uh, he, he likely was a senior when uh, the call sign was applied for, and um, the, the, he went from there. It, it does say that um, he was the, uh, the, made the manager of computers at General Electric. Now at that time, uh, computers were about as cutting edge as anything got. So that was uh, a, quite an accomplishment for him. Now this is a, uh, a member list. The initial year of the club, which was 1949, lists the faculty advisor as John D. Johannesson. Now, John Johannesson actually uh, did some fairly interesting work. He, uh, he specialized in the development of what was called at the time, time domain switching, which later involved into TDM, which we all call and which we uh, all know about now. It's a common technique, but he was one of the pioneers of it. Uh, after he, uh, later in his career, he was one of the pioneers in solid state baseband switching, which was then applied to uh, telephone switches. Of course, transistors hadn't, weren't invented by Bratton, Bardeen, Shockley until 1948. So, but he was one of the early pioneers and early adopters of that particular technology. The radio club needed a home. Now, this was their home. Uh, it was a building called the Case Club. Uh, it was originally a church. It was bought from Beckwith Memorial Church in 1913 by the university. The building contained uh, athletics, uh, recreation, dining facilities, a gymnasium, and an infirmary, of all things. Uh, the club station was actually located in a large closet it was just off the gymnasium floor. Uh, the rig was a, uh, an old 100 watt Temco uh, surplus transmitter and the receiver was 
some version of, of national tube type receiver. Um, despite the modest station, the Case Amateur Radio Club had entries in uh, uh, the November sweepstakes and the ARRL DX contest in, in these years. Interestingly enough, uh, the Case Amateur Radio Club from this station provided communications on 80 meter CW uh, for a chess match between the Western Reserve Chess Club and the Ohio State University Chess Club. So this is, uh, this, this is ham radio at its, uh, at its public service finest. Now, uh, the main part of the campus um, is, don't worry, I'll find it. Oh, this thing changes the slide. That's cool. Uh, the main part of the campus is up here. Uh, this is University Hospital at uh, Severance Hall, home of the Cleveland Orchestra. And the Case Club was all the way out here at the northeast corner of East 107th Street and Deering Avenue. So it was a bit of a hike from here to campus, but not too bad. It was, it's still, uh, it, was, it was a workable arrangement. Field Day. Field Day has always been a highlight of WAEDU and Case Amateur Radio Club activities. This is uh, a field day from 1949 in Burton, Ohio. Uh, field days in the, uh, were operated from uh, a place called Case Camp in Loudonville, Ohio. Uh, in 1950 from the Western Reserve Farm out on, on Fairmount Boulevard. And this year was from uh, uh, the parent, uh, the parent, his parents' cottage of Jerry Kilroy, who was one of the uh, one of the members. Now, the uh, the fellow on the far right uh, was W8 UPN, who became W8 PN Hal Brashwitz, who still lives in Cleveland, and I have had many opportunities to talk to him on the air and in person over the years. So he's, uh, he, he was a, a, a tremendous resource in helping me put some of, uh, some of this information together. These were very active years for the club. Uh, the club got a, a piece in the 1950 case yearbook, which uh, was named the Differential. Okay, kind of a nerdy name for a yearbook, but uh, we are talking about engineers and scientists here. Uh, Hal is the, uh, on the, the bottom row, the second one from the right. So Hal was a very active member of uh, the club in, uh, in these days. Unfortunately, this high level act of activity uh, was, was, would not be long lived. W8 URD fell silent. Uh, the, first, uh, the first shoe to drop was that uh, John Johannesson joined Bell Telephone Labs in 1953. So the, uh, the, the club was temporarily with, without an advisor. The club then became inactive in 1953 and WA URD expired in 1955. Back then, licenses only lasted three years and you had to, to renew them. So uh, the, 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 at that point, WA URD was gone. And in fact, by 1960, the Case Club building was gone. It was replaced at that point by the brand new shiny athletic center uh, with you know, the field and swimming pools and things all here right next to the campus so there was not any need for uh, for the Case Club anymore and the university uh, jettisoned it. The club lay dormant for seven years so there's no record of anything happening during those years. In fact uh, Hal, W8PN, returned to the university during those years to, uh, uh, to get a master's degree and was surprised to find that the radio club that he was so active in no longer existed. But there, that, that was the way it was for seven years. Right up until the fall semester of 1962, and at that, at that, uh, in that semester, these two announcements started to, to circulate. Now, they're a little bit short on details, but they do say 
Uh, you are urged to attend an organizational meeting of the Case Amateur Radio Club. This is a good sign. Okay, things may be getting, getting back on track here. Now, no one signed either of these two, but I suspect that they were uh, made and distributed by Chet Slabinski, who was K8OLB at the time. He's now N8RA, and he lives in, uh, in Haddam, Connecticut. Well, Chet did the job, because by the spring semester of uh, the 62-63 school year, uh, Case Amateur Radio Club renovated after many years of activity. And sure enough, last semester, Chet Slavinsky, a junior, initiated attempts to reestablish the club. Go Chet. So, uh, I, I do want to, to point out one thing here. It says that the old sanitary engineering laboratory in the basement of Old Main has become the official meeting place for dedicated amateur radios on the Case campus. The Sanitary Engineering Lab. Hmm. Well, I, I guess every club's got to start somewhere. <laughs> but, but they did, and they were successful. So by the spring semester, uh, WAEDU was born. Uh, this is the first listing from the call book magazine that contains W8 EDU, 10900 Euclid Avenue, Cleveland, and that's been its, uh, it been its address ever since. Now, what about that shack in the sanitary engineering lab? This was Old Main. This was the first uh, building that was built by Case Institute. It was built in 1885, uh, and, at, and at that point, it contained the entirety of Case Institute of Technology in that building. Uh, when it was built, as you can see, Old Main was nestled deep in the heart of nothing. So it was, uh, it, it was sort of a, a standalone institute at that time. In fact, the only building at that time on campus that was older was a Delbert Hall. Now, a Delbert Hall was the home to uh, a Delbert College, which was a women's college. Uh, that, building is at, uh, that building preceded Old Main by, by two years. Actually, that building still stands on campus. And if you walk from here to the station, you'll mostly go right by it. Right now, the university president, Barbara Snyder, has her office uh, in, in the top floor of that building. The club had a new advisor, uh, a physics professor, uh, Marshall Crouch. Now, I had the, uh, the, the, the pleasure of, of meeting and knowing Marshall Crouch uh, in the time that I was here. He was a, a, a tremendously smart physicist with the kind of, of dry rapier wit, wit that would just leave you uh, not knowing what hit you. But he was a tremendously kind fellow. Uh, he was one of Case's original cosmic ray researchers with his, uh, his partners, Fred Reens, Glenn Fry, and Tom Jenkins. They did the, the, the experiment in deep in the gold mine in uh, South Africa that provided the very first evidence for uh, incoming cosmic ray neutrinos. He was also a ham. He became K-LUF in 1958. Now, like any good experimental physicist, he was hands-on everything. He, uh, in fact, there's a picture, uh, a, a note he wrote to the FCC in Detroit asking for the, the forms to renew his own license and W8EDUs. Uh, Marshall was involved in in everything. Now, during these years, the Case Amateur Radio Club started to formalize. Uh, at, this, uh, at this point, this uh, is, is an example of a constitution. This was uh, dated 1964. At that point, we had slates of elected officers for the club. Uh, the club began to have a, a formalized budget to work from. Now, note that the big ticket item on that 63-64 budget 
is a Hammerland HQ 170 AC receiver. Hmm. Okay. Well, that was that was the big uh, the big deal in those days, and uh, as you can see, the receiver was approved. The club was even having uh, its own newsletter. Now, this newsletter says, "Hold her steady, boys. The pass will be over in another eight minutes." Well, that's very well. That's very apropos because that's dated March 1965, and the photo in the inset is Oscar III, which was actually launched um, in um, in on March 9th of 1965. So, uh, the, 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 the guys were, were on top of things. It was also, these were also uh, growth years for the university as a whole. In fact, in 1967 was the single largest event in the history of Case Western Reserve University because Case Institute of Technology and Western Reserve College merged to form Case Western Reserve University, as it's known now. Now, from the standpoint of the Case Amateur Radio Club, what was perhaps even a bigger deal was the opening in 1968 of the T. Keith Glennon Space Engineering Building. Now, Keith Glennon was the president of Case Western Reserve from 1947 through 1966. And also, during, in that period between 1958 and 1961, he was the first administrator of the newly created National Aeronautics and Space Administration. A very, uh, a very busy and very, very capable fellow. The Glennon Penthouse. Not long after the, uh, uh, the EE department moved in, it built a penthouse on the top of Glennon Building for the purpose of uh, doing communications research between the university and the Terminal Tower downtown, which at that time was the, the, the tallest building in Cleveland. They did it by modulating helium neon lasers. That was uh, a, a big thing back then. And the EE department chairman, Bruce Johnson, was kind enough to offer to share the penthouse with the Case Amateur Radio Club. This was a game changer. Nothing was the same after that. And it happened just in time because Old Main was raised and hauled away in, in 1972. Now this is a, a photo of the radio shack about the time that the club moved in. So uh, we had a penthouse. It had a, a little piece of tower, a rotor. And if you, that's the view from the penthouse down Carnegie Avenue. If you were to follow that uh, that road right to the very end of the horizon, you'd see the terminal tower and the buildings of downtown Cleveland. So that's where they were uh, doing their laser experiments, and that's what it looked like from, uh, uh, from the station. So now the club had a terrific place to operate. It also had a modern station, Collins S Line. And the club made the most of it. Uh, the operators started to uh, earn awards. They started to get on the air and, and contest. In fact, WAEDU won the Ohio section of the November sweepstakes contest in 1972 running. This is from the previous fall was the contest. Now, the operator of the station says James R. Stahl, WA3BGE. Well, his, his present call sign is uh, Kilowatt 8 Mike Romeo. He's a very good friend of mine, and I, I knew him long before that I, I came to Case. So he'll, he may pop up later in, my, uh, in, 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 in the history. Field day, you gotta love it. And uh, the Case Amateur Radio Club has always been big in field day. Now, this is what I call field day, because you've got a, a couple of towers, you've got a van that, uh, with a smoky engine, you've got a leaky uh, tent, Field Day just does not get any better than this. <laughs> However, I think perhaps they could have recruited a little mechanical engineering talent uh, for that one tower. It looks like it has a little bit of a, a bow to it. There's the inside of the van, people operating away. Now, the ham who's uh, on the left in that picture is actually not a student, 
that he was a, a faculty member. His name was Robert V. Edwards, W-A-K-I-C, who joined the chemical engineering faculty in 1968. Uh, in his 40 years at the university, he served as the chairman, chairman of the chemical engineering and the electrical engineering computer and science departments and was the associate dean of CASE for many years, uh, as, as well as a, a dedicated ham and contester. W8EDU got some press in the 1970s. This is the CASE Tech, which is the uh, student newspaper geared toward uh, engineering and science students. Now that's a very good article. Uh, I didn't reproduce much of it because it's, uh, it describes what ham radio is for people who don't know too much about it. It's it a very well written article. But one paragraph uh, stuck out to me. It says, Dr. Matthews, the club trustee, has a special license from the National Science Foundation allowing him to use the club equipment in his communications um, work. And anyone can assist him and that's the license that he got that says that the frequency of 19.091.5 is allocated for case to use between Cleveland and Puerto Rico. The 1980s were an area of aggressive fundraising. The S line, unfortunately, was lost to theft, uh, so the club needed to generate funds. It did so by relentless dumpster diving, collecting donations of surplus, ham-festing all the treasures, and asking every ham equipment manager for free stuff. And it worked, because the, sh the shack was completely updated. Notice the, um, the early digital terminal unit. The, uh, the, the, sh the, the club now had real antennas, like a 40-meter beam, and some members who had the skills to, to build the infrastructure. I don't know if that was me or, or not, but uh, we were able to do it. Now, during these years, W8EDU was active. It was always, always on the air. Now, co continuity is always a problem for, for university stations because turnover is built into the, the club's model. But uh, CARC <clears throat> was very lucky and unfortunate to have a core group that really was there for a longer period and were able to keep W8EDU going. Uh, staff people, like Bob Leskovic uh, and Alan McElwain, uh, alumni like uh, Gary AF8A, who's right here in the front row, uh, KB3HTS and uh, grad students who were just gradually trying to discover they didn't want to go to school anymore. But uh, <laughs> radio sport became a, a favorite activity of the club. That's November sweepstakes from 1994. Um, my, my hair never really did look like that, but that's okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, these were not salad days for the club because on April 12th, 1997, the tower fell down. So to make a long story short, uh, the roof of Glennon Building was pierced and uh, caused quite a bit of havoc. Uh, however, this could have been the end of the Case Amateur Radio Club, right there. That could have, could have finished it. But between the university and the ARRL, everything was completely replaced. Now, there we, we had a plan in those days. And there were really three points to the plan, and I think that's what helped make it work. First of all, we tried to stay below the radar. Don't do anything, don't make any waves. Number two, quietly build good relationships with people within the university. People within plant services can be your best friends when you're running a radio station. And third, don't do anything stupid. Now, by that, by that I mean don't do things that will, could cause the wrong people to ask the wrong questions. Think about the consequences of what you do before they do it. Into the 2000s, Edu was on the air. Field Day, 2005. You talk about the core group, that's KB3 HTS running rate on 20 meters in Field Day, 2005, and KB3 HTS running rate on 20 meters in Field Day of 2015. We had our, we, we had our continuity, which really was, it was good luck for, for EDU. This is Field Day of last year, 2008. Now, 
the, uh, the, the, the gray bearded fellow, KMR, is uh, WA3BGE, who earned uh, Ohio its win in sweepstakes back in uh, 1972. So that picture actually uh, represents, I believe, 122 ye total years of W8EDU club membership. Last year, we even had a chance to, we even made the front page of the local paper. This is where my history ends. So what I would like everyone to do, and I implore you to do, is to pick up where I left off with the people who are making history at W8EDU and Case Amateur Radio Club right now. They're, do, they're doing some things that have never been done before. And so history is being made right now. Many of them are, are at this very conference. Thanks, and 73. Any, I know we're, 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 we're scheduling wise, we're having a little bit of trouble, but any, any last question while I'm walking away? Okay, good, thank Which you. I will say, Jim, thank you for all of it. All You're of the, the, the current and future club thanks you. I appreciate that very much. You look after yourself. Nathaniel, you get the name. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Jim's being uh, modest to not mention all of the years he was club trustee during that time. Jim, get back here. <laughs> we got something for you. All right, you probably couldn't see it very well in the, uh, in the photos of the shack on the roof, but until they uh, replaced that roof oh, two years ago. Oh, I'll just use the keyboard ago. down there. Two summers ago. Uh, that yeah. roof was covered in okay. rocks. And so, Jim, in Great, recognition you. of your many years as trustee and expert contester, we want to give you this rock with your call sign and the logo engraved on there. It was, it was on the roof for many years waiting for you, so. Oh, thank you very much, everybody. Laser engraved right there. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. All right.